It's a real, uh, real honor to be here. Thank you very much to everyone here at the Government Summit. Uh, I've been looking forward to this in part because I felt that a discussion about the future of health should also include a discussion about the future health of our brains. We talk a lot, a lot about the health of our bodies, but not as much about our brains. And I think for a lot of people, um, there's this belief that the brain uh, is something that's not capable of really being optimized or, or maintained. Um, I've been a neurosurgeon for some 25 years now, and I think a lot of people think about the brain sort of as a black box. You measure a black box by its inputs and its outputs, but you don't really get to see the inner workings of the brain. And I think that's why people have thought for a long time that it's immutable, it's incapable of being changed in some way. The brain is static and it's fixed. And one of the things I really wanted to convey to all of you today is that that's not the case. Perhaps more than any other organ in the body, the brain can not only stay healthy throughout your entire life, but also continue to improve. And I know that that sounds audacious to a lot of people, but I've worked with scientists all over the world. I've traveled to places where people are cognitively strong into their 90s, even over 100 years old. And I've seen this in the operating room as well. I think part of the problem is for, for a lot of people, the way that we think about aging overall has been a big challenge. We have this preordained notion of it. In the United States, we spend $4 trillion a year on healthcare, and aging is still a, a really frightening process for people. No one desires growing old, and I don't think it's just because it's a reminder of our mortality, but I think in part it's because we, uh, we envision that we're gonna get slower, that we're going to be more predisposed to injuries, that we're gonna end up in hospitals and long-term care facilities. Now, to be fair, we all age. That, that is true. There's, there's no question about it. Even as you're sitting here listening to me, you age a little bit. Um, the lens, for example, in the front of your eyes, those lenses are the most durable, remarkable lenses probably ever designed on the planet. But you get into your fourth decade of life and that lens starts to lose its elasticity and you find yourself pushing the paper further and further away to read, for example. The amount of light that gets through your lens if you're close to 60 years old is about a third of what it was when you were 20 years old. It becomes harder to see in the dark. There, if, you're, if you're closer to 50, about half your hair has probably turned gray. You simply run out of the pigment that gives your hair its color. And if you were to reach in and feel your aorta, which is the, the, the large blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart, it should feel soft and elastic. But as you age, it starts to get crunchier and more brittle, which is why by the time we retire, most of us have some degree of hypertension. Deep within your skin cells, skin's the largest organ in the body, and there's these waste mechanisms that are always being cleared, uh, and, unless you're aging, in which case those waste mechanisms start to fail a bit. And you don't feel any different, but people, your friends and your family may notice that you have a little bit of loss of vibrancy in your skin. And eventually those waste products start to accumulate as age spots. Now if you consider all that and you ask the average person how long they want to live, they will probably give you some version of the answer that it depends. What kind of shape am I going to be in? Are the people that I love still going to be around? So maybe a better question that was recently asked is when does old age begin? And it's really interesting when they, when they look at these surveys. The answer there as well seems to be it depends on how old the person is that is being asked the question. If you are over the age of 65, people think old age begins around 75. People over the age of 75 probably say even older. People under 30 think old age begins around age 60. I happen to have three teenage daughters, 17, 15, and 13, and I asked them when I was preparing for this talk, when do they think old age begins? And they said, how old are you? <laughs> I said 53, and they said, yeah, that sounds about right. 68, on average, was when people said old age really began. But the reason I bring this up, because in all seriousness, when we think about aging, I think it's really important to understand that it's not preordained that your brain is gonna age like the rest of your body. 
It's not at all guaranteed that you're going to lose your edge, that you're going to lose your ability to think clearly, your cognition overall, or your memory. That is considered outdated thinking. And I just think this is really remarkable because over the last quarter century, we learned something that was pretty revelatory in the world of neuroscience. We learned that you could continue to grow new brain cells at any age. The conventional wisdom, even what I learned when I was studying neuroscience a quarter century ago was you got a certain number of neurons and that was basically what you got. You drained the cash over the years of your life. But that's not the case. We believe that in part because the only time we really inspected the black box was when there was a problem, when there was a tumor or trauma. We did not get to see the brain in sort of its healthy state. We did not get to understand how the, br the brain behaved most of the time. As our imaging grew more sophisticated, we started to see what the healthy brain really does look like, and it's stunning. Inside your skulls right now, your brain is pulsing. It's robust, it's changing, and it's growing. And there's now a way that we realize and appreciate that within our skulls is an entire universe. There are more neurons in your brain than there are stars in the sky. And on top of that, we realize the brain can reliably grow sharper, develop more connections between those neurons, function more efficiently as it gets older not despite it getting older. It has had longer to learn. It is the ultimate example of machine learning, which is part of the reason I've dedicated my life to it. People often ask, like, how do you define a healthy brain? We, we know how to define the health of lots of organs, you know, the heart, the liver, your kidneys. You can measure things, blood pressure and cholesterol levels, liver function tests, creatinine levels. But what is a healthy brain? What does that really mean? From a neuroscience perspective, it's, it's really interesting to think about the fact that a healthy brain may be most clearly defined by one that has a robust and healthy population of new cells, of new brain cells, and that they are constantly exchanging, constantly being created at any age. So if we know this, this process called neurogenesis, the idea of growing new brain cells, what does it mean? Well, it, it has a lot of implications for what are some of the largest and most concerning neurodegenerative diseases uh, that are coming in the world, such as Alzheimer's. But it also raises this question, if that is possible, then how do I do it? <laughs> how do I create these new brain cells? And I thought I'd spend just a, a few minutes here giving you a few pearls of wisdom that I gleaned. I, I spent a lot of time talking to scientists who worked on this research, and I asked them, how do they fundamentally live their lives now differently because of what they've learned? And, and the way that I sort of broke this down is into the big buckets of how we live our lives, through movement, through nourishment, through rest, through connection, and through discovery. Now, I'll preface by saying as a general rule, what is good for the heart is good for the brain. That is true. We've had a lot of knowledge over the last several decades about how to improve and maintain our heart health. And there's a lot of things that are, that are crossing over. But there are some important differences as well. And that's what I want to focus on. So let's start with movement. More than anything else, I think movement is the most reliable way to grow new brain cells. The more you move, uh, the more you are sending signals, essentially, to your entire body that you want to be here, that you want to be healthy. But most remarkably, you're sending a signal for the brain to create a substance known as BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. You don't need to remember that, but think of that as sort of the miracle grow for the brain, as one scientist put it to me. It's this substance that is actually promoting that neurogenesis, telling new brain cells to grow. You cannot ingest it, you cannot, have, you cannot eat it, it can only be made by your own body. Now, Movement, no surprise, is good for you. Everyone already knows that. But here's one of the big differences, I think, between the brain and the heart. When it comes to the type of movement that is good for the brain, it's probably more moderate movement, brisk movement, not intense. When you're doing that, you're producing a lot of this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Intense exercise can be good for you, certainly good for your heart health. But the problem is when you're intensely moving, intensely exercising, for example, you're also making a lot of cortisol, 
which is a stress hormone, and that can actually inhibit the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So intense activity may be good for the heart, but if it's the brain health you're looking for, moderate activity is going to be better. I'll focus on a distinction when it comes to nourishment as well. Um, again, we have a pretty good sense of what comprises a healthy diet, and one of the things that we focus a lot on is sugar. We know that we eat too much sugar. Human beings used to get sugar a couple of times a year, predominantly when you know, fruit fell from the trees. Even honey was protected by the bees. But now, on average, we eat about 100 pounds of sugar a year, and we know that's too much. But what happens is when you're getting a lot of calories through something like sugar, your body's response is to assume that maybe I'll never eat again or I'm not going to eat for a long time. So it takes all that high dense energy and basically stores it as fat. But that's not what the brain does, as it turns out. And this was something that was learned about 10 years ago. The brain is very sensitive to glucose. So as your blood glucose starts to really rise, the receptors in the brain, instead of absorbing all that energy, they turn off. They simply stop absorbing any energy. So at the same time, you're eating a really, really calorie-dense meal full of a lot of sugar. You could be overstuffing your body and starving your brain at the same time. It's a difference between the brain and the rest of the body. Hydration, critically important for all functions. Hydration is one of the substrates that is necessary for BDNF. But one needs to keep in mind that the brain itself is 85% water. What that means is just 1% dehydration can lead to a 5% decrease in cognitive function. 1%. I mean, I think this is one of the most under-recognized things that we talk about with regard to cognition overall. A 2% decrease in hydration can result in acute short-term memory loss, uh, objective problems with mathematical computations, and an inability to store long-term memories. Just 2%. So sugar and water so critical when it comes to brain health for, for those reasons. Sleep or rest, again, we know is important, but for the brain, sleep is not a period of inactivity. In fact, it's one of the most metabolically active times for the brain. And we know that your brain is constantly creating waste products, and those waste products are constantly being cleared, but it is during sleep when that waste clearance is most efficient. So sleep is really important for clearing away some of the substrates that may be the precursors to things like amyloid plaque, which uh, is associated with Alzheimer's disease. We also know that sleep is when you actually take your short-term memories and you actually put them into a long-term memory store. I often tell my friends, if you have these wonderful experiences in life, you need to sleep in order for them to actually become a part of your life story. Social connection, really important. Again, something that we've known for some time but we're starting to get data and understand why some of these things are important. When you're having deep social connections with people, you tend to make more of a substance known as oxytocin, which is something that can also amplify the impact of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. One of the things I think is, is so important is just thinking about how we use our brains overall. Um, people often ask me, you know, do we in fact use our entire brains? And the answer is yes, we, we do use our entire brains. But we probably use about 10% of our brain 90% of the time. It's kind of like living in a single city your whole life. You get to know that city really well. You can drive those roads probably with your eyes closed. But you haven't really traveled outside your city. You really haven't traveled the world very much. Think of your brain sort of the same way. The brain's all there. Maybe you've seen these other places on the planet of your brain, but you haven't really spent time there. That is really the art of discovery when it comes to, to brain health. If you, if you start to do things that are different in some way, you can imagine yourself actually visiting these different parts of your brain, doing brand new things or doing familiar things in a brand new way. A lot of times people will do things like crossword puzzles and brain training exercises, and those can be really good, but it's kind of like getting even better at understanding the city in which you already live. You can already drive those roads with your eyes closed. If you want to actually build new brain cells, build more cognitive reserve and resilience, you need to travel within your brain. For me, when I started learning some of this stuff, I started doing things like painting. I'm a terrible artist, but doing something that was totally different, and in this case, I'm right-handed, I started using my left hand. 
So a brand new hobby with my non-dominant hand is the sort of type of discovery that can help build that, that cognitive reserve. You could try brushing your teeth tonight with your non-dominant hand, eat dinner tonight with your non-dominant hand. It's amazing what that does to your brain, how quickly you can build that cognitive reserve. But also more practically speaking, if you were to have some sort of problem, uh, a trauma or a neurodegenerative problem, the idea now that you have all this, uh, all this existing cognitive reserve can really improve your chance of recovery. Also, it's this idea that if you have a lot of cognitive reserve, you're not redlining all the time. You're not barely keeping up. You're not crushed by life's daily events, but instead you're sort of strengthened by it. You're able to use those events and actually strengthen the brain, creating more of that neurogenesis. None of what I described is, is hard, um, but it shouldn't necessarily be easy either. When we talk about the brain, we're talking about the most enigmatic three and a half pounds of tissue anywhere in the known universe. It is this remarkable supercomputer that we have in our skulls with a parallel operating system known as consciousness. There's nothing else like it. But we are learning every day about how best to maintain it. And yes, you can. You can maintain it, you can optimize it, and we know now that it's a beautiful thing to, to believe that you can build a better brain at any age. I hope that inspires you. Thank you very much.